Hey everyone, in today's video, we're going to be going through seven stocks that just hit 52 week lows in the market. Now, before getting into this one, if you like this type of content, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the thumbs up button, it really helps the channel with the YouTube algorithm, and would love to hear from you in the comments if you have any thoughts on any of these companies or any other companies in the stock market right now. Before going through the seven individual stocks for today, I just wanted to talk about the dynamic of looking at stocks that are at 52 week lows. You know, we hear a lot about people buying dips in the market, dollar cost averaging down, but it's really interesting when you get the stocks that are at 52 week lows, especially if the market's not at a 52 week lows, low, understanding is there fun something fundamentally wrong with the company? Was the forecast way off? Has their company's financials or profitability changed in a really big way has there been developing news so it's not always as simple as just buying a stock as their stock price goes down in hopes that it goes back up uh, where it was prior sometimes when things are in free fall there's a bit more to it so as we go through this video for the most part we'll look at a couple layers deep into a couple of these companies to understand even though they're at 52 week lows are they really a good value or what what are you really getting into um, when considering buying these companies. So the first stock that hit a 52 week low here today is Canopy Growth Corp. Canopy Growth Corp is a marijuana company primarily. I believe they manufacture marijuana. They used to retail a lot of uh, marijuana as well um, in Canada and areas of the US, but I think they primarily are a manufacturer um, or wholesaler rather now. This company is down 77% in the past one year finally hitting its lowest share price of a buck 54 today. If we just look at this company a bit longer term, it's had an absolutely wild ride. Um, let's just go from 2016 was at about $3, went all the way up to over $50 on two, three, four occasions there before going back down to $10 and then went all the way up to $42 in the last few years and has steadily gone down from $43 to a buck 50. So this company um, has been very volatile, a lot, a lot of speculation around the space and regulation and government action, um, and the stock's really traded behind that. But if we really just look at the fundamentals of this company, you're paying over a billion dollars, 1.1 billion today. So just imagine what you were paying up there, um, you know, 10 billion, 20 billion, et cetera, even more than that, depending on how many shares they had outstanding. But this company in the second quarter, so on a quarterly basis, uh, did 120 million in revenue, lost double that, 230 million, negative adjusted EBITDA numbers, negative free cash flow, gross margins of 3%. So they really, for the first part are not even growing revenues down 10% versus the second quarter last year. They have no signs of profitability, gross margins on like a manufacturing business to have enough meat on the bone to pay employees, um, marketing and have enough after tax income. You really need like 50% gross margins. So they're not even in the ballpark. And this is a company that's been at it for like 10 years. So it's not like they're just feeling out the space. Um, then on free cash flow, just in the quarter, they burned over 10% of their market cap in free cash flow. Going a bit deeper into their you know, income statement here, 117 billion in net revenues and 114 million cost to achieve those revenues on cost of goods. And then another 125 million on SG&A Share-based compensation, $10 million. This company is not one or two levers away from having reasonable profitability. And I believe they have about, um, I think it was about a billion dollars in, in cash on their balance sheet. Uh, is it on this page here? All right, well, I lost it. But around a billion dollars of cash, at this rate, like that's about a two-year run rate given how much money they're burning on a quarterly basis. So obviously if they can magically find a way to turn it around, um, 
that's what the people who are buying the equity uh, think are going to happen here. Um, this is one that I, I think will eventually get just keep getting diluted. They have no line of sight to profitability. Um, they're going to keep losing nine figures um, every quarter uh, from here on out until something material happens on regulation. And then even after that, there's probably going to be a lot of capex to build it out. So I think more and more shares will come online. Um, I think as I was looking at one of the, the sheets here, uh, here's a good one. They went from 393 million shares to 471. So in a year, they pretty much diluted the shareholder by 20%. Uh, you own 20% less of the company just because they had to raise money through share issuance because they can't raise money through profit since they're losing so much money. So by the time that this company actually has an operational business model that's profitable, I just fear that you're going to get diluted like crazy and the stock price is just going to go down, down, down um, as they do either, you know, stock splits downwards to, to increase the price or to um, issue new shares. So as you can tell, not one that I'm overly interested in. I don't think they have a business model that is sustainable clearly, and I don't see how they're going to get there given how far off they are across the board and in, in their balance sheet and their income statement. The second stock that just hit a 52-week low, this company actually has some, some net income. So let's look at this one, PetMed Express. So just giving some background on the company down here in the bottom right corner, um, is an online pet pharmacy business based in the United States. It is publicly traded, sells prescriptions and non-prescription pet medication. So this company is down 40% in the past year, um, down 14% year to date, and just hit a 52 week low here today. I wasn't personally aware of this company before I found it on the 52 week low list, but it's a pretty small company, $325 million. Um, and it is, at a 27 times earnings multiple, according to Google, Google Finance. Just looking at their business a bit, you can kind of get a sense for why they have been dipping in, in, in share price. If you just look at their revenue, so they actually did less revenue after having a record year in 21, did less revenue in 22 than they did in any of the prior five years. So a bit of a red flag there. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting how the company and their earnings report call it out as an area of growth. Um, so industry growth of 15% lost opportunity. So I'm not sure if they're just being, um, realists and, and it's kind of saying like, Hey, like we, we should have, um, captured more of that growth, but it seems like they were doing an okay job, especially in 21 and it just dropped off a cliff. I don't love when companies cite acquisitions as the accelerator for revenue growth because it's not organic. You can keep diluting shareholders and buying companies and it's not really creating any value. Um, but high level, this company is essentially stagnant on, on revenue growth. As we look at their financials, they're actually on that $275 million annually. This is about you know $15 million in, in, in net income. Um, which given the size of the market cap really isn't bad. It, it, it's pretty similar to uh, that like 25, 26, 27 times PE multiple that Google Finance has quoted here. So what you're doing is you're pretty much paying a high 20s multiple for a online pharmaceutical business for pets. Um, and if you look at like some other companies like Chewy um, that are kind of breaking into the same space, um, they trade at similar, if not higher multiples. So I don't think this company is necessarily overvalued without knowing much about the space. Um, but it is a very small company. So super risky, very volatile. As we look at it over time, you can see it was over 40 bucks down to 15 up to 40 back down to 15. So it, it's a bit all over the place. Um, they obviously don't have a strong revenue growth model since they've kind of gone up and down over the last five years. And I'm not sure if there are eventual plays to get acquired or grow the business from here, um, but just not a space I'm personally interested in. But this one, at least I can see the the case for taking a flyer on it a bit more than than Canopy, if you couldn't tell <laughs> from my thoughts on, on stock number one. Okay, going into stock number three. So 
Nutrien uh, hit a 52-week low here today. Nutrien is a company that's based in Canada, but they trade on uh, the U.S. stock exchange as well. And they're essentially a fertilizer company. It is the largest producer of potash and third largest producer, producer of nitrogen fertilizer in the world. Has retail locations over North America, South America, and Australia with over 20,000 employees. So big company, big fertilizer play. This company is a bit all over the place in terms of their earnings. So you can kind of see um, this year or this from quarter to quarter, they're jumping from a buck fifty to four dollars. Current year estimate is about nine dollars and forty cents on average. Next year is about eight dollars, so going down 10-15 percent. So very volatile, and that's just the nature of I guess a more commoditized business. Um, but I guess for some diversification, if you want exposure to fertilizers and, and the commodity cost of fertilizers, it could be an interesting play here trading at, um, you know, seven, eight times earnings, um, versus current year estimates. You just have the volatility of not really knowing where it's going from here. So personally, I don't think it's a great option to have a huge part of your portfolio. Um, but definitely an interesting, um, diversifying opportunity and you know if, you, if you're going to buy these at least in my opinion the time to do it is when they're at, at 52 week lows so not one that i'm overly interested in because i think it's just a bit speculative and playing the commodity uh, but definitely an interesting one to to note for anyone who may be interested in learning more um, now that it just hit a 52 week low the other thing here that i kind of like to see is with their free cash flow that they're spinning off from having such a low PE um, is they're buying a lot of shares back. So that should create value for shareholders, even in an environment that maybe the commodity price goes down as they're taking net shares off the market at 52 week lows. Um, that's probably, uh, generally speaking, a, a good you know place to place capital um, for shareholders. Going on to stock number four here, Upwork. So Upwork, lots of you may have heard of Upwork. It is a American freelancing platform. Um, the company was formed in 2013. And es essentially what this company does is has over 12 million registered freelancers and 5 million clients that are hiring these freelancers. More than 3 million jobs worth over a billion dollars were put together in 2017. So this is kind of taking people who are working for themselves, doing creative or digital type work, and linking them with companies that are willing to pay them for contract work, project-based work, and they're taking a cut out of both sides probably. This company just hit a 52-week low, um, down over 50% over the last one year. Market cap's $1.4 billion. And if we just look at their revenue for 2023, they're guiding about $700 million, so they're trading about 2x revenue, but they make no EPS, they're actually negative on EPS, and adjusted EBITDA, I'm just going to call it flat, because they've only one quarter is really crystallizing and it's negative. Um, and even as the year goes on, they're really not achieving much scale or many synergies throughout. They're essentially predicting like 2% margins on EBITDA, negative margins on net income. So this company is break even to negative um, overall. And I just think Given the space that this company's in, as more people are kind of re returning to work and more people are, more companies are cutting unnecessary costs and projects, I don't think this one's really set up great to achieve profitability um, in the next 12, 18 months. So this is one that, um, you know, while they're, they're slowly glide pathing back to the right direction, um, I, I just don't think it's positioned the best in this environment. So not one that I'm interested in, despite being down 50% at a 52-week low. The next company here, Virgin Galactic Holding. This one uh, hit $2.98 here today, so under a billion dollars. This one, to me, I never understood it. Um, it went all the way up to, geez, I didn't even know it got over 50, but over $50. So from there, we're down 95%, you know, for me, if you were buying a space exploration company with no revenue, no realistic line of sight in the next 24 months of 
doing anything with any real consumers and it was trading for $20 billion. Um, I don't think it's shocking or you can be shocked that your investment's down 95%. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I never really saw the investment thesis in a company like this um, other than a hype play or, you know, some Reddit, uh, Wall Street bets play or I don't know. It just always seems somewhat far-fetched and somewhat far out. Didn't think this is the type of company that should be public. And unfortunately, people who were buying throughout or buying it all have all lost money in this. So one that I won't touch even if it goes to a dollar. I just have no interest in a company that has no line of sight to profitability and is relying on a complete new category that doesn't exist and probably won't exist for a handful of years um, to play in in order to derive future cash flows. So just one that I thought I'd call out is it used to be a pretty high profile company. It's, it's kind of fell right to the ground and it, it's just interesting to see, um, these companies in hindsight after it's kind of gone through that hype cycle up all the way to 50, 60 bucks a share, $20 billion value, um, down to essentially bankrupt. So just, Putting that one in there, hit a 52-week low today. Stock number six, I believe, is iHeartMedia. So iHeartMedia is about $500 million market cap company. For those of you who, who don't know about our iHeartMedia, just to read a bit here, it's the number one audio company in the U.S., reaches 90% of Americans on a monthly basis, and has over a quarter of a billion monthly listeners. Has a greater reach than any other media company in the U.S. So this is when you're kind of on your way to work and listening to the radio, whatever it may be. Um, they also do podcasts, it looks like, uh, leads the audio industry in analytics and attribution technology for its marketing partners. I'm just reading off here. I'm not really familiar with the company. Um, but I've heard about iHeart before, just like on the radio and stuff. So surprised it's only a $500 million company. With that being said, you look back over the year range, um, this company at one point was trading closer to $3 billion value and it's really just gotten annihilated down 80, 90% from the top here, um, which is uh, really interesting to see. And, and I don't know all the drivers of it, but looking just at the numbers here, um, you can kind of see their overall revenues just for three months is over a billion dollars. So this company is trading at a fraction of um, their revenue base and they're also making uh, decent EBITDA margins as well. So it'll be interesting to see how this you know, goes down into earnings per share. So we'll go into analyst estimates here. You can kind of see this is a pretty contentious company. Some companies or some analysts rather have this company losing half its market cap for 2023. Others have it losing just 50 cents um, while others have it essentially breaking even. And then... If you go to next year, it gets even broader of a of a gap where some companies have this company making over a dollar in EPS. As a reminder, it's a three dollar and fifty cents share. So some some analysts think this company is going to be trading three times earnings next year, while others think it's going to be losing um, about twenty percent of its market cap in earnings per share. So the streets kind of split on what's going to happen to this company where their net income is going to come in. So this one is one that is, is really like taking a flyer. Obviously, if they actually do over a dollar of EPS, you'd have to imagine the stock would at least double um, or up 70, 80% to six, seven bucks trading at uh, five, six times earnings. Um, but if it goes and loses 75 cents a share next year, uh, you, you could see it go down from here. So this is one that um, not personally going to touch, but more of like a casino play if you want to take a flyer, take a gamble on their ability to turn a positive EPS number and get a better multiple. Um, that, that's really what you're betting here. And, and even the quote unquote experts who follow the company um, aren't on the same page in terms of how this is going to play out. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see uh, if this company continues to hit new 52 week lows or where it goes from here. The last company we're talking about today, and I kind of cheated a bit on this one, but it is Whirlpool Corporation. They're not technically at a 52 week low today, but they're about 1% off. I just wanted to add this one because it's a more popular name. More of you guys have heard this company versus some of the other companies that we were talking in this video. 
and they are paying over a 5% dividend yield here, trading at a $7 billion valuation. Whirlpool, for those of you who may not know, is a company that um, owns a lot of kitchen and laundry appliances brands. Some of their brands include Whirlpool, KitchenAid, Maytag, um, etc. You can you can kind of read off if you want. Uh, 2022, they did over 20 billion in sales. So if you just look at that, they're trading at about a third of their sales from last year. If we look at their um, annual report here, you can kind of see some of their sales by region. So they play very global, obviously primarily North America, but also in Europe, Middle East, Africa, 20% of their revenue, 15% in Latin America, and they have a bit in Asia, um, but not too overdeveloped there. And they're pretty well diversified across cooking appliances, fridges, laundry appliances, and dishwashers. So that's good to see they're not focused on one area specifically. Going to analysts here, pretty wide margins too here. Looking at next year, for instance, some analysts have them at $15 a share, others at $22. Um, average is 18. So if we take the average here, they're really trading at about seven to eight times next year's earnings. And they're trading about, oops, they're trading at about nine times current year earnings. So this co company's trading really, really uh, cheap. Lots of people are probably concerned just with the macro environment, people not really dishing out on these kinds of purchases right now. In addition to that, no new or limited new housing is being built um, with interest rates as high as it is and inflation as high as it is. So the the backdrop's not great for this company, but lots of it's been priced in. So this is one that I think may be a good opportunity to keep on my watch list if it keeps going down, keeps hitting 52 week lows. At what point does a company that made a billion dollars last year on 20 billion of sales um, get a better valuation than seven billion dollars? So especially if this goes down to six billion, you're kind of trop talking six to seven times trailing uh, earnings per share, eight to nine times current year earnings per share, and six to seven times future earnings per share. So if you can get 15% returns on a multinational company who's been doing it for decades, feel like that's a good opportunity to keep on your watch list, especially when you're getting paid a 5% dividend to wait for the economy and the housing market to turn around. So I'd say the general theme of this video has been just because a stock's at a 52-week low does not necessarily mean it's a good buy. I don't think I'd be overly interested in any of these names with the exception of maybe putting Whirlpool on my watch list, keeping an eye on Nutrien if you wanted to play in fertilizers or in commodities since it's at a 52-week low. But other than that, lots of these other companies just are at 52-week lows because they kind of deserve to be there. They've had years to make it work on their businesses from an operational standpoint. And if anything, it's gotten worse. Um, and their revenues are declining uh, in an environment where they have business models that should have secular growth. So lots of these companies deserve to be where they are. I think Whirlpool may be getting a hit, a hit a bit too hard, but we'll see how it plays out. And if you guys have any companies or any thoughts on these companies, we'd love to hear from you in the comments. If you've made it this far in the video, please also let me know in the comments. I really appreciate people that watch these videos all the way through. If you haven't yet, would love if you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you guys in the next one.